everybody, I'm T. Ferguson. Welcome to The Distillery. This is an ongoing conversation for and by our creative media communities. And I'm Patrick Jager. And in each episode's conversation, it's an opportunity to talk about the things that are challenging our creative communities right now and where we think our industries are going to have to go in the next. As we know, 2020 did not turn out exactly as we expected it to, to mm -hmm. so we, uh, we, <laughs> we all have to pivot, we all have to make some changes, and we all have to expect some different outcomes if we want to thrive as we move forward. So here is how the distillery works. We have three rounds. First is the now round. This is when we get to talk about, complain about, brainstorm about the now, where we are as a creative community. Secondly, we have a two-on-one -on -one conversation with one of our guests on topics that really fit what they do within our creative collective community. And then third is our next round. And the next round is really kind of pontificating or prognosticating about where we need to be six months, a year, or farther down the road. All right, so all of our episodes start with uh, us looking at the results of a poll that we've conducted. We've asked a lot of our colleagues and our friends, specifically this week, uh, considering current events, where do they think profit margins are going to grow or tighten moving forward? Um, obviously, uh, interesting topic in the best of times. We know that uh, people have been a little nervous. Patrick, you want to give some of the details to the results? Yeah, I think it's going to come as absolutely no surprise that we have a 50-50 split. Interestingly, it's 50-50 split in I don't know to I'm really nervous about profit margins. Very little on the side of profit is great. But, it, but like a lot of things, you're seeing people saying they're holding their breath. Um, and in the kind of sub responses we got, you're seeing a lot of people that are really showing their anxiety. One of, our, one of the people that responded said that they were furloughed and then lost their job and they are hoping the profit comes back because the only way they're going to come back to work is if there's profit. You know, it is so layered. It, it's, uh, you know, where do we start? What's the most important profit to make? Is it, is it start yeah. at the retail level? Is it start at the internal level? The, you know, there's, there's a lot of TBD right there. So, and the important thing is getting people back to work and figuring out how to, how to write the ship for sure. Well, I think, um, I think we have some guests and some folks that can help shine a little bit of their opinion and, and point of view on this matter as well. Um, so why don't we introduce Absolutely. who we have today? Great. First up, we have Michael Wayne. Michael is co-founder and CEO of Ken Community. Now, if you don't know Ken Community, you're missing out on maybe the most innovative slate of high-profile talent-driven shows focused on women that they term in their builder years. Michael, I want to hear a little bit more about that when we start talking. But over the years, I've seen Michael's mastering the tightrope that is brand plus talent plus distribution. It's not as easy as it sounds to thread that needle. So having you, Michael, on for this episode talking about finances and profit, I'm really excited to hear from you. Nice to see you. Thanks for having me, Patrick. You're welcome. Uh, next up, we have Chief Revolution Thinker at RevThink, CEO Tim Thompson. Uh, welcome, Tim. RevThink is the leading consultancy of high-performance creative firms in media and entertainment with literally hundreds of firms, I think like 23 different countries, that are benefiting from the advice of Tim and his team and what they dish out. Uh, a really interesting fact Rev in RevThink is both for revolutionary and the fact that Tim is an ordained minister. Do I have that right, Tim? That's right. That's right. I, uh, okay. I chose the name. I shrunk the name down to RevThink to have that little bit of a twist on the reverend um, point of view. So yeah, Very it's good. part of the idea of serving the industry and serving people to build them up uh, so that they can thrive in their life and career. And finally, our special guest we'll be speaking to in our two-in-one segment. We're honored to have Brendan Gall with us today. Brendan is Global Chief Content Officer and Head of UM Studios at Universal McCann Worldwide. Brendan has spent more than a decade developing creative work for Johnson & Johnson's brands across all of their sectors, as well as other IPG clients. I, for one, am incredibly excited to hear more from you about where investments by brands may be heading in the future. So we'll get into that in great detail. Brendan, great to have you here. Oh, thanks so much. Glad to be here. All right. So I want to get back into the poll. So I asked this question before, but I'm asking it of you again. This was a, uh, something that came in and we're going to go, we're going to jump right into our now round, which is all about what is happening right now. And I think this is very apt. Scary times. Not sure what the future holds. I know so many out of work. What's better, profit or jobs? Can we have both? Uh, flip of a coin in my head. Michael Wayne, I'm going to start with you. Well, I, it depends. Uh, you know, I know that's that's never the the perfect uh, answer to a question, but uh, you know, from our perspective, which is really from digital media, 
um, and ad supported, primarily ad supported digital media. Uh, you know, it, it's been, um, it's been a, a pretty turbulent last six months. I think we saw um, interesting things play out. You know, advertising in Q2 basically went away, but viewership of our content across platforms went way up. Um, and what we've seen is now slowly over the last few months, we've seen CPMs come back. Viewership has stayed pretty steady, but there's still a lot of uncertainty. So from our standpoint, um, we, were, we were very lucky in the sense that our content um, rebounded quickly, our advertisers rebounded quickly. You know, we focus on women in particular, uh, women with kids in the house. And so there, there's been a pretty healthy amount of money that has flowed to that uh, demo, you know, coming out of the, the sort of early days of COVID quarantining. Um, but we'll see. I mean, we'll, we'll see. I think everyone uh, is hoping that there's some stability between now and the end of the year. We've been lucky we haven't needed to lay anyone off. But at the same token, we haven't really hired anyone either. Yeah. Um, we've just kind of hunkered down. Um, I think there's a general sense of cautious optimism, though, um, that perhaps the worst is behind us. We don't know, obviously, with the flu season coming up, what that's going to look like. Um, but uh, but I feel I feel cautiously optimistic that we're getting back we're getting back to business, and we'll see a nice rebound early next year. So, Brendan. Profit or jobs? Can we have both? Oh, gosh, I, I hope we can have both, right? Um, it, it's, it's tough. You know, I, I think for, um, for the people that have lost jobs, you know, they, they're, they're all these creatives that are out of work. Um, but that doesn't mean that they don't stop having ideas, right? And I, I think that, um, you know, we are going to come upon a time where there's just so many ideas in the marketplace um, and the, the people that do have the money to put uh, behind those ideas are, are going to have um, uh, a plethora of things to choose from and um, top talent uh, to access. Um, at the same time, you know, budgets even before the pandemic were, were getting squeezed and, um, you know, everyone's focused on the bottom line and uh, particularly brands and advertisers are um, trying to figure out how to make the most meaningful connection with audiences, um, but for um, a, a cost that doesn't, you know, kind of break their bank. So I think it's going to really be about looking at where there are pockets of money and seeing how they can be redistributed in a way to, to bring creative ideas forward again. Um, uh, but I, I, I do believe that the, the old way of working um, uh, where, you know, brands are, are flush with cash to push, you know, towards, towards big sponsorships or big ideas, it's going to be some time before that comes back. Yeah, and I want to talk to you more. Uh, we'll do it on the two and one about uh, kind of this idea of reallocation, because I do agree that that is going to be a big thing. But a lot of people, Tim, asking the same question of you. A lot of people on the production side, the pure production side, or even downstream, the vendors that support production, uh, and a lot of those are your clients, Tim, where are they feeling right now about profit versus jobs? Are, because I think probably some of the, your companies are maybe even closed by now. Um, yeah, it's so interesting because um, it, there are segments of this industry that are absolutely booming. They, they have more work than they can handle. Um, more money than they've ever seen heading their way. Um, there usually is some kind of tech um, aspect to what they're doing or a specific niche nature to it. Um, and specifically, I believe that in the time of pandemic, there were so many paradoxes people were trying to navigate. And the, the one that I pe see people thriving is the paradox where people were looking for security, but they were also mm -hmm. needed to take a risk because they needed to do something different. So they, they took a risk with people they knew, which I think is, uh, is different than a lot of the way that usually people make decisions is they take a risk by bringing on a new vendor. What they went mm -hmm. is to the secure vendor, but took risk with them. So some people that were, were well positioned could see that. Um, but what's interesting is I, I literally had this conversation this week with a woman who 
believed, she's a business owner, she believed her job was to spend her savings account to keep her employees going, regardless if there was work in house. And I, I challenged her a lot of like the viability of business is necessary in order to keep the long term play happening. And so I believe it's profit on behalf of employees or a profit on behalf of work. And the challenge now is, is stealing the opportunities that the pandemic has given us and finding that value proposition. It's different, but a necessity. And I believe the entrepreneurial spirit finds that new thing. And that's what we should be looking for and investing in. So I want people to spend their money and their profits on investments and growth and opportunity that way. And then know that the employees are secure by doing that instead of uh, putting their head in the sand. I think that's the danger of the economy. Do you find, I'm curious, this, this is just interesting. And Tim, thank you for that. I, I, do you find you're coaching a lot of your clients and the people that you're working most closely with through this process <laughs> right now? Like that that's become such a, a big component of what it is you're doing? Um, yeah, for sure. I think that outsider expert is so helpful because as um, many business owners or even, even leadership positions, we really get stuck in our own echo chamber and we don't know who to process with. We wonder if there's anything good happening out there or, or how to make long-term decisions when you're looking at your bank account every day. So that coach or the outsider perspective allows somebody to get, allows you to present some perspective or some gain beyond what you're used to processing. Um, but also just the idea of just remembering the basics, you know, buy low, sell high. Um, I think uh, to Brendan's point there, the industry has been commoditized a lot. So budgets have been cut back in the traditional areas because those areas are totally commoditized. Tech technology has improved the speed of things and, and people's expertise has been swapped into software. But the creative edge is always a necessity, comes from the human mind and has to be pushed further. So how do we find that new value proposition in these new fields? That's the challenge, but the entrepreneurial challenge, that's what we're, that's what the industry is about as well. You know, uh, Michael, I think a lot about your business model, the type of talent you work with, um, the fact that they're not just talent you hire, but they're partners and collaborators, both, and, and correct me if I'm wrong on any of this, but the fact that they have ownership stake or they have a stake in the, in the game, which makes it a lot easier. But when you start thinking about, revamping business model and you start thinking about um, how to do more with less or how to be more precious because you don't know if it's going to come. Um, how is this time, like, have you had to have some serious conversations with the talent you work with about, we're not going to do it the way we did it before. We can't. We, we have, but I think it's, it's worth putting our business into context. Like we, we started our business many, many years ago with an idea that, um, because social media allows talent to have a one-to-one -one relationship with their audience, they don't need to be hired as talent by a network. They can, they can, they can communicate directly. That would fundamentally change how creative is, you know, produced with talent. And, um, you know, I think, I think there was a, seminal moment i you know i think most people thought of it as a pop, pop culture seminal moment but i think it was actually a um a, a really interesting moment this week just in terms of this like protracted shifting away from the cable business model into whatever is going to be the next business model that dominates hollywood and that was the kardashians leaving e right which is which is a great example of talent outgrowing the platform essentially that spawned them Right. And so for so for us, we just see this as like this isn't just in Hollywood. It's not just with talent. I mean, you see this uh, you see this in music, you see it in sports that because of social media now, creatives and talent have more leverage than they've ever had. Therefore, the, the, the way you partner with them needs to be different. You can't just hire. I mean, you could I guess if you have unlimited resources, you could pay someone to do something. At the end of the day, what, what what's more important, I think, is things like creative control, ownership, mm -hmm. participation, being a producer in things, being a true partner. So from the very beginning of our company, you know, this is going back over 10 years ago, I mean, our first, the first talent we partnered with were bloggers, right? They were kind of the first social media stars. Yeah, I remember that. Direct, direct relationships with their audience. Then that morphed into YouTubers. Uh, and, and, and then that morphed into social media stars. And now we work with, with, 
more or less traditional celebrities. But at this point, what is a traditional celebrity, right? I mean, it's it basically, if you have talent in a large social following, um, you're a celebrity. And the question is, how do you, how, how do you create the right incentives so that you can build really extraordinary content? Yeah. We think we've scratched the surface of that. I mean, we're still in the early innings of it, but, um, but we're excited I, about the future. I'd like to pick it back on that idea. Um, my friend Keith Brown and I do a weekly podcast called Hollywood Breaks. And last week we identified this idea of the end of celebrity. Really this thought of like the influencers you're talking about, Michael, that are coming into play. They're getting the media attention. They're actually getting the paparazzi following them. New York Times did an article about that recently. But what's also interesting is that Zoom has removed this celebrity them away from us. Like it, uh, mm. you and I on screen look the same as a celebrity on screen and they just became normal to us. So well, this end sort of, of celebrity ra raise of influence <laughs> is very interesting. So, so influence, like there are still people that are, are um, have a lot of influence or have a lot of followers, right? You would say that's famous, but the need of a celebrity to be famous, it's a little, it's a little interesting. And I, I wonder if, uh, um, you know, Brendan, like, are you going to see like, marketing following some of that trend as well or if you guys are seeing that already yes certainly and and you know it, it i wanted to jump in on um you know both of you touched on this this concept of partnership right and you know it, it's something that we have to navigate with our clients when they're dealing with talent and when they're dealing with um you know creators or ip holders you know it's a, a, i think um the industry's moved on from this transactional um, we're going to hire someone and they're going to say exactly this for us, you know, and, it, and um, in the same way that, um, you know, traditional financiers are financing um, shows with uh, celebrity talent and there needs to be that collaboration and that partnership. It's same things when the brands are paying for the production, right? It's very difficult to get any, anybody out there with any following that's just going to say like, okay, like I'll say whatever you want. Um, and even as we move into, um, you know, film projects and, and TV projects, uh, you know, it, it's, it's super important that the creators have, you know, full creative control, that they have final cut. But those are conversations that um, brands are not used to having, right? Mm -hmm. the, as, a, as a brand marketer that has a budget that's either going against a sponsorship on a, on a network um, around a show or creating a piece of content, they're used to having um, final say and being able to have an opinion about like what color shirt the person's wearing even, you know, and, and that's not the world that we're living in. Um, and, and it has been, um, uh, you know, it, it's been a great challenge, but, but one where, you know, the, the smart marketers, they get it um, and they, they understand that, you know, you're going to drive a more authentic connection and, and ultimately a better creative product. I think that's yeah. their, their place in the world, right? The, the brands are there to um, put forward finances that give the ability for creators to do their best work, right? Yeah. And, and I, that's where we, we try and, um, and, and kind of uh, keep the conversation. Yeah. We've seen, uh, in, in this, I'd be curious to get your opinion on this, Brandon. Like, so before, about four years ago, we started shifting our model from being more of an MCN where we worked more or less exclusively with YouTube and YouTubers to working with, again, more of these traditional celebrities. And just so we're all clear, I'm defining more of a traditional celebrity as someone who has sort of built their influence through TV or through mm -hmm. traditional platforms, right? Music, yeah. maybe they're a music star or so forth. Um, I think when we worked with brands with YouTubers, brands would be much more frustrated when YouTubers would say, we have to have final cut and you, you control it because there are so many of them and they they don't have sort of this more mainstream, uh, you know, they're not as, they're not as, uh, understood maybe, or even, uh, you know, well known amongst general like agencies. Or yeah. brands. So, so even though they might have the exact same number of followers as a traditional celebrity and have maybe even more influence than a traditional celebrity, but when a traditional celebrity works with a brand, there's sort of a deference, uh, just yeah. because, Ooh, I know that person I know. So it, it's, it's an interesting transition that's, that that's been uh, going on. Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. And, you know, and, and it, it's interesting because it all, it all, um, 
It is back to basics. You know, I think one of you said focusing on, on basics at this time. Um, you know, the, the basics of this conversation is we are trying to um, get a brand and a brand's message to connect with an audience. This, this creator owns that audience. Um, and in the most kind of pedestrian of terms, the conversation with the client is often, um, you know, think of that as a party. You're not being invited to that party. And the only way you're getting in is the plus one of this person, right? And that means you have to take the back seat um, and, uh, and trust, you know, um, because they're going to be introducing the brand to their audience in a way that works for them and, and for that that party, if you will. Um, and then I think that as brands create longer term relationships with those types of creators and influencers, um, then they start to gain a little more permission um, to, you know, stretch the bounds a little bit and, and, you know, potentially even start to create their own content um, and get a halo from that audience onto their own stuff. It, it, it's it's funny, interesting that the uh, so the content game. So we'll say like ten years ago, the buzzwords were branded content, right? This idea of extending commercials is really what it was. Maybe we'd get a brand to eventually finance some sort of platform or piece of entertainment that we'd all be willing to watch. I, I honestly feel like this is the year, right? Because upfronts were a total disaster. Nothing's really yeah. being going to roll out. The media buys are down on all traditional networks the opportunity for a brand to now step in at the price of what used to be a commercial and buy an entire season of content. Like this is the branded content world we've all been waiting for forced upon us. And now I feel like all these branded content makers have no idea even where to turn. Like they, 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 they've, uh, the deficit of content has really forced us into replays or whatever. Patrick, you're going to talk to this. Tim Thompson, yeah. Tim Thompson, you are asking the exact question that we wanted to ask in our 211 with Brendan. Oh. So guess what we're going to do right now, ladies and gentlemen? We're going to switch gears. Brendan, you are on a hot seat for the next five minutes. Sorry. Okay. Um, okay. So I think that this is great, but Tim already asked a great first question. Um, what is, do you agree with, the, with, with his statement? Now, I'll just say like the deficit of content and the opportunity of, of the platforms on traditional networks, you can easily for the same cost, go and make branded content. Like the opportunity is now presented itself and the gatekeepers of traditional networks aren't in the way anymore. They would allow any content to be, be placed out or I'll say, mo I'm not going to give it to all, but most. Yeah. Um, and, but our branded content creators aren't ready. It feels like this is the moment we're waiting for. And yet we're, how do we, are we ready to step into it? Yeah. So it's interesting. So I, I think most aren't ready, but, but some are right. Um, and, and when, you know, you, you, you talked before about, you know, 10 years ago, the way that branded content kind of came forward, I think all that needs to be reframed, you know, yes. and that, <laughs> and that, you know, that idea of branded content really is around like audience first content. Like it's not about the brand. It's about the audience and what they are interested in, what they like. Um, Way, the way that we look at defining content within our portfolio, we, we think of branded content as the stuff that is going to go into paid media, right? And then we also have an original content practice, which is stuff that's funded and financed by brands that's, that's meant to be um, acquired or monetized, right? And, and I think some of the brands that are out there that are, are in the right spot and are making it work um, I think about Shopify and the series I quit that they just sold to discovery. Um, I think about, um, KitchenAid and their film, a woman's place, uh, that they, uh, produced with Vox creative that then landed on Hulu a few weeks ago. Um, you know, our, our film putting, you know, five B and Johnson and Johnson, uh, um, you know, onto um, Amazon after a theatrical and um, TVOD release. Um, so I, I think there are some brands that, that are there, but the, the problem is brands are um, inherently risk averse. And at this moment in time, there is a ton of opportunity, but it's also really hard to make stuff um, and to make stuff that they would be proud of and, um, uh, that, that would, would kind of serve to the level of quality, um, to put out there. I mean, there, there are a number of brands that, 
have called me and said, hey, listen, we have a board that is approved and ready to go and we can't get the um, insurance to be able to actually go out and produce it in this market right now. Um, is there anything that you can help with? You know, so, so I do think that there, there, there's that issue of them being risk averse, but then they're also just not built for this. You know I mean? Mm -hmm. So many um, brands, um, they're, they're not built to take in money from something that, that has been, you know, licensed or sold. Um, they, you know, aren't built to hold IP. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot of things that need to be worked through in the back. Um, look, I think nobody's short on ideas. That's the good news, but there are, uh, challenges in navigating how to actually get stuff done. Brendan, I have, a, I have a quick question about that. Like, it's about how you managed your brands in this process. I mean, as a creative, as, a, as an agency, a lot of brands look to you uh, for advice and guidance and to help navigate in, you know, in the, in the normal world. Uh, during all of this, like, I, I, you know, from an outside perspective, I imagine it was pretty chaotic. I imagine it was pretty, um, it was pretty scary. And you say that they're so risk adverse. What were you saying to them? How, how did you sort of help take steps through the past six months? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it has been um, challenging, um, especially because within a um, brand's marketing P&L, the largest um, cost item is usually media, right? Um, and as there were, um, you know, buys that were in place for, um, you know, shows or sporting events or properties that um, ultimately were not going to come, there, there needed to be um, a recalibration in uh, those relationships and, and trying to figure out like where that money was going to go and, and how much of it could be, um, you know, uh, pulled back or reallocated somewhere else. Um, it, it's, it's been tricky, you know, because yeah. every, um, every sector has been hit in a different way. So it's very difficult to talk about it from a like advertising media industry standpoint, because um, a, a brand like Johnson and Johnson has been affected very differently than a brand like um, Coca-Cola than a brand mm -hmm. like American Express, sure. you know, um, and each of them have, each of them have, um, pros and and cons to the the current environment you know um you know a, 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 it, it's um the market dynamics are very different on every single one i i can't get too specific brand by sure. brand uh, but but you can imagine um the the difference is there so then when you're looking at um their creative product and like what are the opportunities I think you 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 saw a lot of brands and and thankfully that they weren't they weren't many of ours that that rushed to put work out um, in response to the pandemic and we saw that that consumers just in, inundated with this sea of sameness right that well like, and pandering and, we talked about that yeah you know that it was it was um, you know wild that there was just no differentiation spot to spot. Um, creative to creative, and there were brands that that were, you know, in, in my belief, I, I think that they were just filling um, time that they couldn't get out of, right? So they've got this real estate in media. Their current message is completely inappropriate for the moment, so they have to rush to get something um, just to fill the time. Um, and 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 now I think we're in a place where clients can sit back and say, okay, things have calmed a little bit. Um, we can, we again are not uh, beholden to our um, previous media plan and ideas. We can now make choices about where are the right places to go, where are the right ways to invest and how can we, you know, come forward and, and make meaningful connections with our, with our audiences. For me, I've, I have had a lot of clients come to, ask about longer term ideas, right? So we're working on ideas for, you know, 22, 23, 24. Um, we are not being inundated with asks for stuff in the short term. Um, I, our, our clients are, you know, in many ways still, um, you know, taking a beat and, and seeing what's going to come or 
they're looking to, um, you know, their internal teams that run their social channels um, or, uh, you know, relationships that they, that they um, already have with influencers or celebrities and, and reallocating, you know, some of the, some of the things within those deals to, to get some stuff out. You said something interesting to me um, recently about uh, the brands not taking advantage of consumer behavior. And I think that your, <laughs> even your comment about the sameness, yep. um, it is nice that now we finally have sports back and other things that allow people to have something to resonate around. But talk to us a little bit about this idea of yeah. why we need to start thinking more about consumer behavior. Yeah, sure. Uh, certainly. You know, it, it's, um, it's interesting. And, and it, it's, again, one of those challenging conversations with a client because they're so used to like, I have a launch coming this year and then I'm going to make a new piece of work and I'm going to, you know, put it out there to support that launch. If we, if we look at what's going on in consumer behavior and with all of the streaming platforms that have been launching, um, they're filled with um, back catalog work, right? So you think about like, you know, Disney Plus and, you know, all of the historic stuff that's there, Peacock and all of the, you know, old NBC shows that are there. Yes, there, there are new properties on those platforms as well. Um, but, you know, there's, there's such a big viewership of things, you know, like The Office and things like Friends. Um, and, you know, as, as you said earlier, brands have been in the content game now for, you know, 10 plus years. That means they also have a back catalog of work. Um, and I do think that there's an opportunity to look back at work that is still relevant. Um, you know, uh, YouTube shows that have been produced um, and uh, as well as, you know, other kind of short or long form pieces and, and see what the opportunity is there to pull them back. Because if you made a meaningful connection with a consumer, you know, 10 years ago um, with a piece of work or five years ago with a piece of work, um, they'll be remembered, you know, they'll remember that there'll be some nostalgia there. Um, perhaps they'll share that with, you know, a younger sister or their own, you know, child. Um, so, so I do think that that's, that's um, a place that brands uh, are starting to look and starting to play. Um, I mean, I know on, on our, on our side, like we did a project with a brand um, that matched against census data 10 years ago, you know, and it's the 10th anniversary of that, that brand and we, we showcased um, 50 families, one from every state, you know, there's, there's an opportunity to do a check-in with them. Um, you know, there's another brand that we did a, um, a five episode web series um, five years in a row, you know, hmm. well, that's, that's 25 consumers that had an interaction with a brand um, and uh, that property has been, been down for a couple of years. Well, we can always check in with them or we can go back and reboot that work. Um, because I do think that I do think times have changed and um, to the to the previous comment we've brands had like a big push and we're ready and launched all these YouTube shows um, kind of wishing that they could be on TV and now we're actually finding that if you if you build it the right way um, because of the way the world has changed both in streaming you know and in in um, COVID now you can you can get shows onto cable TV. You can get in and, and credibly pitch to networks, um, and we're seeing it time and time again. Um, yeah. And those brands have a back catalog of ideas and, and work that could be pulled forward. Yeah. Hey, Brendan. So what's interesting to me is that you're hitting some of these key points that I think is so interesting. One is, you know, arguably or you know, possibly, uh, 15 percent of all internet traffic goes on YouTube. So just the idea that what used to feel like illegitimate YouTube creation, and Michael's going to totally back me up on this one, is now really the way to do it, that that's where all the viewing audience is. So yep. these brands that used to think, you know, what was really important in getting in front of people on network television have to restructure something. And you said it right. You said like, we're going to have to redefine what the playing field is. There's so many changes that are possible now but it's this old feeling of legitimate opposed to the new reality of where the audience is, how to build an audience, what a brand right. looks like to that audience, and then what content really is. And I believe that's the moment where it, in, a, in the process that we all get to go through because of COVID and what it's done for us, there's now an opportunity to create that new definition because the whole world has been reset 
we're all you know, yeah. level playing field. We're all li living in the same place. And this interaction that we have is now possible anywhere for anyone, right? We, are, we could all just log into Zoom and create some content. What a huge opportunity for a content maker to actually add some creative energy to it and find a new value proposition. Oh, absolutely. No, I, I, I couldn't agree more. I think that it's, it, it, there's a, you know, you talk about reframing it, like there's a whole new frame to, to, you know, paint inside. Um, and I think that it's right, we're ripe to find that new great work, you know, yeah. because the, the rush, the rush brought so much mediocrity um, that now I, I think that there with new new rules or new norms we can start to to really understand how to connect with people in, inside those frames yeah. i was on a panel a, a couple years ago with an agency and they had created a television show for pantene and it was a, a beauty beauty pageant um and the struggle that they had was how to take in the rewards of a of a commercial basically a commercial that they financed for the first season but the rewards of that in that they're basically a picked up for the third season. And they're thinking, yeah. what do we, we don't take in money. We spend the money. What are we supposed to do when our IP is being bought and sold in a traditional right. marketplace? That's the restructuring and new opportunity. And Michael, I would guess that you've probably had to reinvent the wheel a couple of times through the, through these evolutions. For, for sure. I mean, um, you know, we, we, we've been around since, before 2008. So we actually went through the, the recession of 2008 and had to mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately go through some of those, these painful iterations that uh, the world is going through now from an economic standpoint. But what, what changing economics do is it forces some of these institutional gears to start to move, right? So we, you know, cable networks, television network can't produce, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. Let's create new ways of figuring out how to get content on the air. I think, I think there are a couple things that were said that, that, that's really interesting. The, the point about YouTube, I think, is interesting, but I would go one level deeper, deeper. And that is, it's not a creative problem, I think, right now. I think, I think we find that, that if you find a transcendent talent, and, and I think that's really important because I think YouTube talent and traditional talent have oftentimes hard times transcending across platforms. But I think mm -hmm. we are closer now than ever to finding both YouTubers or, or socially native, digitally native folks who can transcend the TV and vice mm -hmm. versa. And I think the bigger problem, although this is pandemic and the economy is helping this, is those organizations, those digital organizations uh, where you distribute, and the television organizations where you're trying, the, the folks at those organizations aren't quite there yet. But, but this isn't a creative problem. This is just getting these institutions to realize that one plus one equals three, that, that the digital group can right. create something that can be monetized across multiple platforms and it's good for everyone. I think the interesting opposition to this right now is as, as, you, brands are risk averse and agencies are risk averse. You know, the branded content, the integrations, the digital innovation, the, the content innovation tends to be the things that dry up first because mm -hmm. to your point, media, it's just, how do I make my media efficient? How do I do all those things? So, so there are these kind of two things I wonder, I'd love your point on like, yeah. how do you harmonize those two things? Yeah. Well, it's interesting because I think, I think those things used to dry up first. I don't know if they do anymore. And I think that the reason that they used to dry up first is because the base of the plan was the, was the TV spot. And now I, I think that, I think marketers have moved, right? I, I don't think that the base of the plan is necessarily the spot anymore. And, you know, as eyeballs are shifting, um, you know, some of the, uh, from ad supported TV networks, dollars are going into entertainment sponsorships. They're going into co-marketing with studios and streaming platforms. They're going into production company direct um, deals so that they can get into shows that can actually get onto Netflix and get onto other platforms that are taking ads. So, so I think that's one, one kind of space. The other thing, as you talk about the digital group to the traditional network group, what we're doing in our digital deals when we, um, build a show with the digital arm of a media owner 
is we are saying, okay, let's do 10 episodes of a digital thing, but let's, you know, doesn't have to be 10, just we're doing a, 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 an order of a digital show. And what we are thinking of this is, is that it's a pilot for network. You know, it's a pilot for the, the cable side of the business. And then um, if the network decides they don't want to pick it up, then the rights res revert back to the agency and the brand to go take it somewhere else. Um, so, because I, I think gone are the days of the brand investing in content and then it being monetized by other people, right? Like that, that's, um, I, I think that, that brands that's are getting gone. smart on that. Yeah, you know? totally. So yeah. speaking of gone are, gone are the days, I think that's a, it's a good way to segue into our next round. Um, and we've already started doing this, talking about sort of how things are evolving into the future. Uh, I'd love to, and just keeping an eye on time too, um, make sure that we get some distinct perspectives from all three of you about putting you on the spot a little to kind of predict what is next. What is the future in your own specific buckets of what are the priorities? What are the things you're aiming for? How are you, how are you getting your clients, your business, et cetera? Uh, forward thinking. Let's start with Tim. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, not an easy job. And um, not being a production company owner, you know, what we're trying to do is actually coach people through it and advise people through it. That's what we do at RevThink is a consultancy. Um, and we're basically collecting pieces of other things we see and, and bring that in to be part of our advice. Um, but the opportunity for the future that I'm looking to guide my clients into is really look at the changing landscape and um, I believe what most people hear when we talk about a changing landscape and opportunities is to make everything new. And that's, that's a really difficult gap to fill. You can't just jump over the Grand Canyon. You're gonna have to start filling in pieces, one piece at a time. Um, so a lot of what I'm looking for people to do is recognize the opportunities right in front of them and start being a problem solver and problem engager instead of just a service-based um, uh, solution for things. Uh, it sounds to me like other people are leveraging ideas, like Michael's talking about talent, uh, Brandon has uh, uh, brands to bring into it. Um, a lot of production company owners that I work with, they're working with uh, service-based businesses or, or editorial post-production crews, all that, that's the kind of opportunities. But this shut-in behavior that we now get to take advantage of and be able to work from anywhere in the world should now be able to open up that talent base and explore new um, and educate people in a new way getting new platforms out there, new visual arts creation out there, and maybe even some of these unknown marketplaces where talent sits to be as relevant as the LA New York marketplace that have dominated for decades. Um, those are opportunities I'm looking for. And I think the real you know, directors, creative people out there are finding those resources and bringing them to the forefront. Um, I believe the challenge they're gonna have and which is why it's great to have these guys on the panel with us is getting the other side to listen to the opportunity. And I think that the, the vocabulary that we use, these old words that we say like branded content have to find new words to it. Mm -hmm. I think that we have to get people out of the commoditization of services into something of creative field. And we're gonna have to start thinking through the, the playing field in that way. And it's discovering those new words to, to convey those ideas. That's gonna be the challenge that we're up against. Yeah. Brendan, what about you? Uh, you? You talk about working with brands that, you know, for 2022, 23, 24, that far out when it's so hard to even really predict what's happening next week and with everything so frequently right. changing. Where do you even start? Where do you even start there? Yeah, yeah. It, you know, it, it is tricky. Um, and, and Patrick and I talked about this. It's like you, you've got to build ideas with um, enough uh, elasticity in them that they can change to meet whatever the, the, the new media platform is going to be, you know, when it, when it's time for it to come out. Um, you know, where, where we've been having the kind of future proof progressive conversations with clients, um, it, it is around, you know, following those eyeballs to non ad supported, um, platforms. So it's around carving out, um, money out of your media budget to put into investing in premium content that um, can go out and be acquired by um, a distribution partner. Uh, it is tricky, you know, it, much like the conversation earlier about the digital side versus the network side, you know, brands are thought of as the buyer, right? Brands are not thought of as the seller. So 
Um, it, it's about building those partnerships with um, IP creators that uh, are, are selling that work into those networks um, and distributors on behalf of the brands. The, the other side of it that I think is, is really interesting is audiences are not, um, they're not uh, you know, tied to certain uh, networks anymore, right? It's not like you have an ABC household and a CBS household anymore. Um, they're following the shows, right? And they're following the shows wherever they go. Uh, the way that we're counseling our clients around that is to start having um, deep relationships with creators and IP owners, because if you find a showrunner who um, is open to partnering with brands and you get so far upstream, you're building a relationship where that relationship could wind up with something that is a TV show on ABC, another TV show on Netflix, um, a film that's being released by Paramount, a, a podcast that's on Spotify, right? Because if, if that creator becomes an advocate of your brand and they're building like, and writing their shows um, from the beginning with, th with the brand in mind, it's going to come in organically and it's get, going to get you into really interesting places. So, so those are the two places that we're, we're you know, pushing. Uh, to, to kind of have a more future-proof conversation. That makes sense. I love future-proof. I mean, as best it can be, that's the, <laughs> that's the goal. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Michael, what about you? I, I mean, I'm sure six months ago, just the, the, um, the content topics and conversations and the talent that you have involved, you know, with, with the content that you're building must have been thinking one direction and then and now to have to pivot so greatly. Are you, are you having sort of the human conversation about well, what's the right type of content with the right type of talent to be having in a post COVID post pandemic world? Are you taking that into consideration? For the well, I, I'd say certainly over the last six months, there have been ebbs and flows in terms of the type of content. Um, you know, I, I think there was definitely at the beginning this pullback on we don't need to be hawking products right now mm. in our shows, you know, and like, let's be sensitive to the fact that people are losing their lives and losing jobs. And, and, and it's interesting because I think some people got that message late, uh, some, some YouTubers, some talent, and got some blowback from like continuing to, to, to kind of do their usual day in and day out programming and their day in and day out brand integration. So I think that was one thing. I, I think, uh, you know, I think there's probably a little bit of fatigue um, in terms of all of the self shot stuff. So we, we typically shoot our shows with small crews, relatively small crews compared to TV. Obviously that all went away and we outfitted our talent with cameras and lights and mics and said, hey, why don't you shoot the shows, self shoot the shows. Uh, and then we'll edit remotely. And I think our talent after four or five, six months of doing this would like to see crews again, even though it's more safe to do it without crews and, you know, um, certainly more economical to do it without, uh, you know, without crews. Uh, but I think there is sort of a yearning for seeing uh, a little bit more professionally produced content because we've been so in what watching zoom and watching self shot and all of that. Uh, kind of getting back to the point before, I think um, you're going to continue to see downward economic pressure on cable networks, particularly the mid-sized cable networks and the, the smaller one, but even probably some of the bigger ones, which is going to which is going to be a catalyst for innovation. We don't have as much money to spend. We gotta be we gotta be thoughtful about what we do, which will allow more creativity uh, onto some of these bigger networks, and we're seeing that you know, our licensing revenue from last year to this year is up 400%, right? Like we're seeing networks come to us to say, we want your content on our That's network. That's awesome. Because you keep Amazing. producing content. Our model is built on having expertise on open social platforms. And, and those open social platforms, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, have matured enough from a monetization standpoint to actually support production. If yeah, you can excited get, to hear. If, if you can get that to work, it opens up so many opportunities to SVOD, AVOD, cable distribution. That's why I'm optimistic. You know, you just said something, and, and Brendan, actually all of you have said something that, that 
really, I think it's going to impact a lot of the people that are watching this or that I hope are watching this. You know, it, it's one thing at the level of the three of you, right? I think the fear is if you are at the level of a kin or, you know, UM worldwide, um, you can be talking about these things. But, you know, there, there is this, I want to, I want to kind of close with what's your advice for everybody else? Because a lot of people are the mom and pop shop or they're a solopreneur or they, you know, they're, they're not necessarily known and can't get directly into the SVOD game. My premise or my, my thought off of something that Michael, you said was actually you all have, you know, part of this is educating people on what you can bring to the table that is innovative, that is not going to feel mediocre. Uh, Brendan and I had a conversation the other day about mediocrity and that, that there's going to be a leveling because you're going to separate the wheat from the chaff here. And a lot of people might go away for that. So Brendan, I'm going to start with you on this. Yeah. What is the advice for the person who's like, I came to this because I just need the sense that there's a future. Right. And how, what advice do you give them? Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I think that the great news, look, there, there is a future, right? Um, and, and there's a future for, um, you know, at least from the brand perspective, there's a future and will always be a need for brands to connect with audiences. So I would, I would counsel, um, I would counsel people to figure out like which audiences do they connect with? Like the work that they create, um, the, the stuff that they're producing, who's it for? Get really good at understanding that audience mm -hmm. because that's the work that brands will fund, right? Brands are, are interested in reaching specific audiences. And if you, can, if you become that authentic voice in media that can deliver that for the brand, um, I, I think that that's, that's where you'll win. I, I think that you can't try to be everything to everybody anymore. Not right now. Well, I have a couple of thoughts. Um, one is uh, I love where Michael is, was thinking about the, the, these um, AVOD platforms that are out there and the opportunity to, uh, for distribution on those platforms. I really feel, Michael, you're going to get a lot of competition in the near future because if, if that's what's thriving, you know, people, are, people are aiming towards you. So here it comes. Right? It's already there. That's, yeah, yeah unfortunately. I'm sure. Um, you know, Patrick, this is no stranger to you. You're the one that created this reverse engineering, but it really is important to keep things straight of the why, who, where, before you deal with the what. And I think too many people go into any kind of a design process or creative process with trying to make a show that they would love to watch. So they have the what they're going to make first, and then they have no idea of where the audience is, who's going to distribute it, where the, where the monetization is. And that's a foolish game. It's taking a shot in the dark. I'm glad um, you were listening. <laughs> the the, uh, the opportunities I want the the smaller companies to do really is to kind of devour what's in front of them. Um, we have this thing called the factors method. It's when we divide up the costs to right size the expenses to the budget. And I think too too often people want to compare yet yesterday's budget and therefore the expenses attached to it to the revenue today. And then we say budgets have been cut back. In reality, like it's going to be an accordion going up and down and you have to see where the money's flowing and then make the right decisions in ratio with the, the revenue you have, the, ex the expenses that are out there and be entrepreneurial, think differently about it. Um, but that different thinking is what's going to create an edge for you and you can grow. I just love the conversation we're having here because you can hear the perspective of the opportunities and what's, what's possible out there, but also recognize that the, the bigger folks are also challenged with the change as well. And the big or small now, we all have something to, to kind of climb up a ladder with um, and you know, capture this new future. Michael, I had you, uh, we asked you to talk first, so I'm gonna ask you to talk last. What are your thoughts? Hey, look, what are the, what's the advice you'd give? Listen, I'm a perennial optimist, so you're you're gonna hear you're gonna hear optimism from me always. Um, look, if if we take a step back and we look at the last 20 years and we look at the next 20 years, I would say we are in a generational, if not multi generational, shift from economies of scarcity to economies of abundance. Right, where everyone with a phone can have a shot. Right. And, and when we were all growing up, you know, you had to get a 
call your cousin who knew a director who worked on a film to get a PA job, to maybe get a you know, give someone coffee. And that was it. Like that was how you got into the creative game, right? From a high level, it feels like um, making movies and TV shows are going behind paywalls. And if you're going to spend serious dollars, they're going to be financed primarily behind paywalls. And that there are new companies like Amazon who see that as very valuable. Yes, Amazon uh, sells, sells merchandise. That's their primary business model. But they've co-opted something that says, you know what? People love movies and TV shows. So we're going to finance this almost as a marketing thing, right? Not even almost. It is a marketing thing. It's c- customer acquisition, customer retention, right? What's interesting is, you know, you look at YouTube, they got into the game of doing high quality and scripted and and, and unscripted, and they kind of got out. They kind of went back to what they're good at. Facebook, we'll see. IG, we'll see. TikTok, we'll see. I would say, learn it all. Like, understand how technology is playing a factor on the scripted side with SVOD, understand how it's playing a factor in social, understand how it's playing a factor in AVOD. Learn, because technology... Yeah. is is the driver of this however many year shift from abund- from scarcity to abundance and abundance isn't going yeah. anywhere. No matter how much you try to put Pandora back in the box, there's still going to be, you know, this abundant, there's always going to be avenues for people to experiment and, and try things. Great, yeah. Jake. I honestly, I, I hearing learn is such, it resonates so much with me because I think we're all in a spot where we're all learning. And it was back to that. Like everything has changed and we're, it's, it's leveled the play fi- playing field to where we're all learning something. And it's great advice for somebody who's just starting out. It's also really good for all of us to remember and to remember to communicate that to everybody else so that they feel comfortable with the fact that, yeah, like some things we, we're figuring out in real time. And so the learning process, hey, maybe we can make it fun, right? <laughs> and, and that can make it interesting again. <laughs> um, amazing advice from all three of you. Thank you so very much. Uh, I, I, Patrick and I started this because we wanted to have these types of conversations where we're putting great minds together and, and talking through things and letting it all flow. And, you know, we're hoping that there, and I'm not hoping, I, I do think that there's an audience for this because um, it's good to see how people are navigating through all of this and how there is optimism. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, with the exception of a couple of mentions of a crash, co- crash course into <laughs> oblivion. <laughs> um, it, yeah, I, it, it's good to hear all of the optimism. It's good to hear that, you know, through, through different lenses, there's a little bit of struggle, but there's a lot of hope. All right, guys, so let's talk about next episode. Uh, our poll for next week is, do budgets and client expectations allow for true creativity? Especially given all of the current production and storytelling restrictions that we're under. Um, I am really excited to hear from the, from the uh, creative media community about this right now. Please log on, uh, log on to our website, thedistillery.live. You can participate in the poll. You can always leave us comments or suggest other topics or guests which is actually a really good uh, segue to, to thank all three of you, uh, Tim, Michael, Brendan. Uh, it's a real pleasure and honor to have you with us today. Um, and, and you've been really great. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, thanks so much. Thank you. Yep. Absolutely. And uh, guys, we will have links to all of your sites. And for the community, we will have follow-up items we've mentioned here. Really, we do encourage you to get involved. And, and on behalf of myself as well, thanks, guys, for being here. And with that, Mr. Ferguson, thank you as well. <laughs> Thanks, Patrick. Uh, this was fun, and we really do want to help cultivate this for our creative media community. Um, times are uncertain, but we are all in this together. So uh, please log on to the distillery.live and get involved. Thanks for being part of this. Thanks, Bye, everyone. Nice to meet you. Thank Thank you. you. Uh, Thanks so much. You. Bye, guys. Here. Bye. As always, we'll see you next time. The future is now.